We're going to, we have assembled a group of elders and we're going to um, ask them to come up now. You know who you are. Um, and if you would come forward at this time, um, Bishop Sidney, um, Iola, Donna, let's see, Norm Wesley, um, Murray Still, Grace Delaney, and I think I've called everybody out. And at this time, uh, we're going to invite our primate to come and he has something to address to us, to us all. And uh, please, Archbishop Fred, please come forward. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to sit with you and to share with you an apology for spiritual harm. And I do this in the presence of the, the General Synod because apology commits us all to action. For a number of years since the Indigenous Covenant of 1994, there has been a call for apology for spiritual abuse endured by Indigenous peoples through the era of colonial expansion, and particularly through the era of the Indian residential schools. In his apology to survivors of the residential schools delivered on August the 6th, 1993, Archbishop Michael Pierce expressed his remorse on behalf of the Anglican Church of Canada, saying, and I quote, we tried to remake you in our image. Tonight, I offer this apology of our cultural and spiritual arrogance toward all Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and the harm we inflicted on you. And I do this at the desire of many people in our church. I do it at the call of the Anglican Council of Indigenous People. And I do it at the request of and with the authority of the Council of the General Synod. I confess our sin. in failing to acknowledge that as First Peoples, living here for thousands of years, you had a spiritual relationship with the Creator and with the land. 
we did not care enough to learn how your spirituality has always infused your governance, your social structures, and your family life. We did not care enough. I confess our sin in demonizing indigenous spiritualities and in belittling the traditional teachings of your grandmothers and grandfathers preserved and passed on through the elders. I confess the sin of our arrogance in dismissing indigenous spiritualities and disciplines as incompatible with the gospel of Jesus and insisting that there was no place for them in Christian worship. I confess our sin in acts such as smothering the smudges, forbidding the pipes, stopping the drums, hiding the masks, destroying totem poles, silencing the songs, stilling the dances, and banning the potlatches. And with deep remorse on behalf of our church, I acknowledge the intergenerational trauma caused by our actions. I confess our sin in declaring the teachings of the medicine wheel to be pagan and primitive. I confess our sin in robbing your children, in robbing your children and youth of the opportunity to know their spiritual ancestry their indigenous spiritual ancestry and the great wealth of its wisdom and guidance in living a good way with the creator, the land, and all their relations. For such shameful behaviors, I am very sorry. We were so full of our own self-importance. To quote the Book of Common Prayer, we follow too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We were ignorant. We are insensitive. We offended you. And I believe we offended God. As we look to you today, we've come to acknowledge our need to repent. And as we look to God, Again, to quote the Book of Common Prayer, we say to the Creator, we have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things we ought not to have done. I've learned that an important part of repentance is sincere lament. 
and that an important part of lament is our solemn intention to lead the new life, following the commandments of God, walking from henceforth in God's holy ways. So with humility, I ask our church to turn to the Creator, seeking guidance and steadfastness of will in our efforts to help heal the spiritual wounds we inflicted. Let us as a church commit ourselves to learning how traditional indigenous spiritual practices contribute to healing and to honor them. I remind our whole church of our solemn responsibility to honor the calls to action from Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, notably call number 60. This is how it reads. We call upon leaders of the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faiths in collaboration with indigenous spiritual leaders, survivors, schools of theology, seminaries, and other religious training centers to develop and teach curriculum for all student clergy and all clergy and staff who work in Aboriginal communities on the need to respect indigenous spirituality in its own right. The history and legacy of residential schools and the roles of the church's party in that system, the history and legacy of religious conflict in Aboriginal families and communities, and the responsibility that churches have to mitigate such conflicts and prevent spiritual violence. I am praying that the General Synod will be united in directing the Council of the General Synod to establish a committee to strategize and guide the ongoing work of truth, justice, and reconciliation, including the building and supporting of a network of ambassadors for reconciliation from dioceses and regions. Working in consultation with our animator for reconciliation, a significant part of their mandate will be to forge paths for enabling healing for all deeply hurt by spiritual arrogance. Helping the whole church to learn from the spiritual wisdom of the elders and to listen with a heart to the spiritual hopes of indigenous young people and restoring spiritual teachings and ceremonies that were lost and celebrating them as a vital part of a gospel-based way of life. I remind our church of our solemn responsibility to honor our General Synod 2010's public endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, drawing particular attention to Articles 12 and 15, 12, 25. Article 12 declares, Indigenous Peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies, the right to maintain, protect, and have access in privacy to their religious and cultural sites, the right to the use and control of their ceremonial objects, and the right to repatriation of their human remains. Article 25 declares 
Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, and other resources, and to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. I call the whole church to continually pray for the vision keepers commissioned by Bishop Mark MacDonald and I at General Synod in 2016, holding our church publicly accountable in respecting the right of Indigenous peoples to be self-determining. I call our bishops, clergy, and lay leaders to draw elders into conversations regarding the practices of the past. At one time, we banned expressions of indigenous spirituality in Christian worship. Having seen the errors of our ways, we are now encouraging such expressions. Many of the elders have followed those bans out of loyalty to a church they love. Many of these have at the same time kept alive the values and ideals and teachings of their own elders. And today they are an essential guide both to the underlying teachings embodied in the practices of the past as well as the teachings of Christian faith. Today we are asking the elders with utmost of respect to help guide us, to honor the wisdom and practice of the past, and to live into a truly indigenous expression of our faith in the future. I have heard a number of elders speak of how the children and youth of this generation, and as you have taught me, the seven to come, that they are in great need of the opportunity to be grounded in a spirituality true to their indigenous identity. Let us stand with the elders in encouraging the youth to lay claim to their indigenous spirituality as their right and in their pursuit of health and happiness. I call the Church in consultation with the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples to grow that much-valued resource, a new agape, 2001, a new partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in the Anglican Church of Canada. I ask the whole Church to be extraordinarily generous in building up the Anglican Healing Fund and its support for initiatives that advance the healing of language and culture abuse, oppression, and the intergenerational trauma, the learning of traditional knowledge and spiritualities, celebrating Indigenous identity, and embracing the reality that Indigenous peoples should be able to enjoy everything God created you to be. I call the whole church to fully endorse the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples intention to move forward with your plan for ministry shaped by the teaching of the elders, 
by gospel-based discipleship and commitments to a prophetic pastoral care rooted in wholeness and healing in indigenous community, freedom, and joy. And finally, I call us to renew our commitment to our baptismal covenant, especially our vow to respect the dignity of every human being, to strive for justice and peace among all people. And in living this vow in a good way, to embrace the seven grandmother and grandfather teachings, love and respect, truth, Honesty, wisdom, courage, and humility. I offer you this apology in the name of Jesus Christ, the great pain bearer and the great peacemaker. I have hope that through him and in him, we will be able to walk together in newness of life. Thank you for listening to me. Fred, uh, just before I receive that document, uh, I believe it was some uh, nine years ago, on a hot, hot summer day in uh, Winnipeg, and at your enthronement as the uh, 13th primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, Asip asked the uh, the co-chairs to uh, present to you uh, a pair of moccasins, certainly to wear, but at a more um, symbolic level, invited you to join us uh, on a journey of uh, healing, reconciliation, and self-determination. I'll always uh, remember that day. Your Grace, on behalf of uh, ASIP, on behalf of um, Indigenous, Metis, and Inuit people of this land, my most gracious thanks. 
for your offering of an apology for the spiritual harms inflicted on the people of this land. This is a, a good thing to do. A good thing to do. As we continue to walk together in a spirit of goodwill, healing and reconciliation. The uh, elders of the circle have asked me um, We would like to take uh, this document, we've received it, to take this document, an apology for spiritual harm, and for the elders to spend prayerful time, prayerful time reflecting on uh, this moving document, quite touched by it, um, and to offer uh, our, our response um, sometimes prior to the adjournment of this meeting of General Senate. Um, and I would like to ask or request for your consent to do that. Thank you. Thank you all for standing at this very important moment. And for some of us, this has made us, it's, it's very moving what we have heard, what we have witnessed. And some of us will be a little shaky um, because um, these are words that are, have been longed for and and in some places, hard to imagine that they would ever come. So, um, <clears throat> we're, um, we're asking uh, or we're offering the opportunity for indigenous people to come together. The Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples, uh, ASIP, has a room on the fourth level, the Port McNeil room. And for those who wish to get together and talk, talk and be together and sit with each other, uh, we're going to do that immediately following the close of this gathering. Uh, so we invite uh, indigenous people to join us there and we will have a chance to um, reflect some more about what we have heard. So uh, with that, at least for our part of this, um, we, we have finished.